like to introduce to you Alejandro Salvador Fernández Allende, the grandson of Salvador Allende. Hola. Hola. Um, thank you very much for welcoming all of us to the dream country. And in this, indeed, this is a dream country. It's a beautiful country. It's a magic country. So thank you man, so much for the welcoming. Uh, I have a speech here. I'm going to read in Spanish um, because it's closer to me, uh, to my emotions. So I want that to show. El, este discurso, uh, so this speech starts with a um, part of the uh, Cuban anthem. It says, No temáis una muerte gloriosa que, por ir, que morir por la patria vivir. Quiero dar las gracias a todos ustedes por estar aquí presente en esta fecha tan importante para Chile, Latinoamérica y para la memoria histórica. Quiero también darle gracias a los organizadores de este evento, a Tishin Federation a las Union, a Carisma Calillamba, a miembros del Parlamento que nos acompañan hoy, al embajador de Cuba, Tenerís Diegues, al embajador de Chile, Jaime Chomadí, al embajador de Venezuela, Daniel Gaspar, y a cada uno de ustedes. Quiero advertirle que algunos de los temas que hablaré en este día son difíciles y lo haré con profunda delicadeza, humanidad y altura de mira. Mi nombre es Alejandro Fernández Allende, soy, hijo, soy el hijo menor de Beatriz Allende y Luis Fernández Joña, cuyo nombre real es Rodolfo Gallá de Grau. Mis padres desde temprana edad sintieron el llamado de la revolución en Latinoamérica y pusieron sus vidas al servicio de la humanidad. Les cuento que cuando ocurrió el golpe militar, mi madre estaba embarazada de mí. El día 11 de septiembre, Beatriz se dirigió a la moneda para ayudar a repeler el ataque final al Palacio Presidencial. Fue el mismo Allende quien tuvo que expulsar de la moneda a mi madre, a su hermana Isabel y a varios compañeros. Fue así como Allende en sus últimos minutos salvó nuestras vidas a través de su propio sacrificio. Siempre pienso en los momentos difíciles y finales de Salvador Allende, donde mi abuelo era presidente, era también padre, era marido, era gigante, era soldado, era mártir, también era la república en llamas. Parte de mi familia salió al exilio a, a Cuba gracias a la, a la asistencia de la Unión Soviética que envió sus naves a Chile, las cuales salvaron la vida de cientos de compatriotas. Yo nací dos meses después en el, corazón, en, el, en el hospital Sagrado Corazón de La Habana. Mi madre Beatriz inmediatamente asumió muchas responsabilidades en Cuba y por muchos años fue el líder de la resistencia en el exilio. Desafortunadamente Beatriz no pudo vivir con la pena enorme que tenía y tomó la decisión de terminar con su vida el 11 de septiembre de 1977. El 11 de octubre de 1977. Yo intuyo que mi madre murió de forma simbólica el día del golpe y también una parte mía murió con ella el día de su partida en aquel fatídico octubre. Los miembros de la familia Allende raras veces hablamos de trauma de aquellos años, pero creo que es importante hablar del dolor, hablar de la pérdida y de estos temas, porque el silencio es siempre dañino. Quiero aprovechar de darle las gracias a la República de Cuba, a la República de Venezuela, a través de sus, a través de sus respectivos embajadores, pues ambas naciones recibieron miles de miles de refugiados chilenos, argentinos y de muchos otros países durante los días más oscuros de nuestro continente. Gracias a vuestra solidaridad y a vuestro trabajo humanitario, muchas vidas fueron salvadas. Cuando venía viajando, a, yo vivo en Nueva Zelanda, cuando venía viajando a Australia de Oakland, me pregunté qué es lo que realmente significa el quiebre institucional en Chile. El 11 de septiembre representa la ruptura, la herida, el duelo constante y al final abrupto de los sueños y aspiraciones de millones de mujeres y hombres. Hoy somos uno en la memoria y en los anhelos de justicia. Sabemos que el, hombre, sabemos que el 11 de septiembre el, el ejército de Chile, de Chile traicionó su mandato democrático atacando el Palacio de la Moneda que, represente, que representa la esencia misma de la República. 
Hoy también quiero decirle que los cobardes del ejército de Chile bombardearon la residencia de Tomás Moro, donde se encontraba mi abuela Hortensia Luce indefensa y protegida solamente por un puñado leal de guardaespaldas y compañeros del GAP. Salvador Allende, en sus últimas palabras, le dice al pueblo y le dice al mundo, colocado en este tránsito histórico, pagaré con mi vida la lealtad del pueblo. Y les digo que tengo certeza que la semilla que hemos entregado a la conciencia digna de miles y miles de chilenos no podrá ser cegada definitivamente. Tienen la fuerza, podrán afriarnos, pero no se detienen los procesos sociales ni con el crimen ni con la fuerza. La historia es nuestra y la hacen los pueblos. Es decir, que... Es decir... Queriendo decir que las ideas jamás podrán ser asesinadas. Muchos de los que estamos aquí, aún, para muchos de los que estamos aquí, aún nos llegan los ecos de esos días donde la ciudad de Santiago estaba bajo el humo tóxico de las bombas y el río Mapocho arrastró en sus aguas los cuerpos acribillados y mutilados de las primeras víctimas de la, primeras víctimas de la, ja, de la jauría sangrienta militar. Hoy también recordamos al héroe de Miguel Enrique, a los hermanos Vergara, a Víctor Jara, a Rodrigo Rojas, a Carmen Gloria. En estas efemérides tenemos presente a los profesores degollados, a los desaparecidos, a los ejecutados políticos, a, a los torturados y a los exiliados, y aquí nadie queda olvidado. Hoy también agradecemos a nuestros queridos amigos australianos, que desde un principio hasta el presente eh, nos han, han caminado junto con nosotros y nos han ofrecido su solidaridad. Quiero contarles que los, que los pilares de Chile post dictadura fueron construidos sobre la impunidad. Recuerdo que en esos años se hablaba de la justicia a la medida de lo posible y esa justicia llegó para una minoría. En Chile hubo un chantaje por parte del ejército en contra de la sociedad civil para que la verdad y la justicia nunca vieran la luz del día y esa es la verdad. Hoy nadie queda olvidado, no, hoy nadie queda olvidado y somos uno en el duelo, en la memoria, en la aceleración y también en la esperanza. Pasando, pasando a un tema local, me gustaría pedirle a cada uno de ustedes que sigan presionando a las autoridades australianas correspondientes, australianas correspondientes para que Adriana Arribas sea extraditada a Chile lo antes posible y tenga que enfrentar la justicia en Chile, de la cual huyó cobardemente. No es posible que alguien culpable de crímenes en contra de la humanidad hoy, hoy haya encontrado refugio en estas mismas calles que hoy caminamos. Hoy Allende vive y vivirá por siempre. Allende es querido y recordado en todo el mundo porque quien muere por nosotros, quien se sacrifica, quien se sacrifica por los altos valores de la humanidad, jamás conocerá la muerte. Me gustaría terminar estas palabras con un texto del premio Nobel, Pablo Neruda, que fue también asesinado por la dictadura militar. Este escrito de Neruda es el paro final de sus memorias, confieso que he vivido, donde describe cuando mi abuela fue llevada por los militares a enterrar el cuerpo de Allende de forma oculta. Dice Neruda, tenían que aprovechar una ocasión tan bella, había que ametrallarlo porque jamás renunciaría a su cargo. Aquel, aquel cuerpo fue, fue enterrado secretamente en un sitio cualquiera. Aquel cadáver que marchó a la sepultura, acompañado por una sola mujer que llevaba en sí mismo todo el dolor del mundo. Aquella gloriosa figura muerta iba acribillada y despedazada por, la, por las balas de las ametralladoras de los soldados de Chile que una vez más habían traicionado a Chile. Gloria eterna a Salvador Allende, Gloria eterna a Beatriz Allende, Gloria eterna a todos nuestros caídos. Muchas gracias.
Qué bueno tener es it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here in the New South Wales Parliament. <laughs> yes. Well, you're not allowed to record, but we're doing it anyway. <laughs> Who cares? I'm not going to tell them. <laughs> no one here but us chickens. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us today, particularly at this uh, memorable occasion of 50 years since the coup, the U.S.-led coup. Tell us, you're living in New Zealand for how many years now? I've been in New Zealand at least uh, 22 years. 22 years. Yeah, I consider New Zealand like my second exile. To be yes. Honest. In exile, and you go back to Chile often. I go often to see my family, they are all of them in Santiago, mm -hmm. um, with COVID. I could, so I, I will go this November, yes, um, to see them. Yeah, yeah, so I go quite often, once a year at least. How would, how would you judge the understanding of the people of New Zealand and Australia about what happened? 50 years um, ago? I mean, most of the people don't have a clue about what happened uh, 50 years ago. You really need to talk to people who, who um, you know, they have interest in history, or you know, um, in the universities, academics. Um, but I mean, the the, the folks you know, that you talk on the day by day, case, yes. they they don't really know um, about what happened exactly in Latin America during the, the Cold War. So the people here today are mostly Chileans. Who yeah, uh, they're Chileans, but there are also a lot of Aussies that they uh, they've been supporting um, the Chilean struggle against uh, Pinochet for many many years. So there are a lot of friends and, and people that uh, from, from here that they've been uh, working together along with a, a Chilean exile um, for decades, basically. Now tell me about the effort to try to declassify some documents that yeah. would show that yeah. Australia helped the United States. Yeah, cool. yeah. So I I didn't know that, <laughs> so, uh, but that doesn't surprise me because I mean if you if you go to the just say Sydney Harbour every time I go I see like um, um, warships everywhere and sometimes in Americas and, and it happened a lot of time and you see the news the exercise so um, I'm sure uh, and and, what, and also what happened during the Vietnam War um, so <laughs> who support what. Um, so I have no um, doubt in my mind, I mean in my heart, that the Australian uh, government supported uh, the CIA and Henry Kissinger um, to overthrow Salvador Allende. Yeah, it's an alliance, basically. We don't know the details yet. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's what I think. Um, I, I, I would love to um, obviously read that once it's available. But it will be good. Well, as you say, Australia has this long history, first serving the British Empire yeah. in their wars, yes. and now the American Empire. Yeah. In That's Australia. quite correct. Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq. Yeah. Exactly. And it's now joining AUKUS to put pressure uh, on China. It's quite, a, it's quite imperialistic behavior, basically. It's extraordinarily dangerous to Australia. It doesn't help Australia's interests at all, but it helps the U.S. interests. Right? I know. I know. It's hard to understand that. Now, New Zealand still has their non-nuclear policy, but there's even a move in New Zealand now to maybe join AUKUS, it's been yeah, introduced. I know, they're under pressure as well, exactly. Uh, it's, now, I'm from the United States, uh, and I can tell you that um, probably worse than here, the percentage of people who understand not only what happened in Chile, but all across Latin, Operation Condor, the entire brutal uh, first stage of American post-war empire, as World War II really played out in Latin America by rehabilitating really Nazi ideas in many ways with these military dictatorships. Would you agree that the United States, uh, this was an important part of their post-war empire, what they did in Latin America, and the people who survived, Chile and Argentina and Brazil and, and well, Uruguay, anyway. all of these countries, were really victims of American empire? Correct, yes. And we were victims. And I, I grew up in Cuba as well. Yes. So we had an embargo, you know, and it was like really difficult. And now Cuba is, is, is really struggling at this moment uh, due to the post covid recession and now the embargo. So they're, they're, they're having you know, a lot of difficulties in, in now, Cuba. Now, in the United States, uh, history is not very important, uh, except the mythology and mythological history of America's founding, its greatness, its democracy, spreading democracy. But as the um, Uncle Jimmy said that in the United States there is no truth in reconciliation commission. No. There is no memory of what the United States government did, even having the School of Americas in U.S. territory. And uh, in Panama. In Georgia. I was about that. And in Panama Canal Zone, they ran it from there. Extraordinary. 
So how important is it, do you think, for the American people to know the history of your country and all of Latin America and the America's involvement? I mean, I would love that. It will be extremely important. But American people are just not interested in history. I mean, mostly, as you said, they really... Um, I mean, the, the normal people that you speak to them, they, they don't really know. It would be great. It would be really helpful um, if they uh, care and if they, um, you know, start showing interest about um, uh, about the um, geopolitics of America in the in the Latin America in Latin America uh, in the rest of the world, which is obviously imperialistic, and now I believe it's a empire in decadence. And that's what is happening. I mean, all these things that when they, you know, when Guantanamo, when they uh, openly recognized that the use of torture, so that that's totally uh, moral decadence. I mean, once you reach that level, uh, it's a, you, you you can see that these people are going down as well. You know, it's it's really. Uh, I, I think we are going through dangerous times, and there is a lot of populism. There is a lot of fake media. Um, propaganda, and it kind of remind me um, um, the first year uh, of Hitler uh, before he, you know, he went into the power. But um, it's it, it certainly it's possible that history repeats itself, and it happened, and it could happen, and we need to be ready for that. Um, let me go back to why do you think American people are disinterested in history in general, particularly what happened. In Latin America, is it uh, because they uh, they have no lack of natural curiosity, or is it the media? Uh, the I think um, it, it's pretty much um, the media. Um, it's pretty much um, uh, well, uh, you know, selecting what people you know should be interested in. But also, it's it's, it's your own. You know, if you want to read, you know, you, you grab a book, you study, etc. And I'm not sure if people have time for that. Um, that that's. Every time I, I talk to people who they are in America, they always seem so busy, you know. And they, the, the economy is not good, so they have two, three jobs. And then, um, really, they talk about their life. Um, but I think uh, intuitively that there is an um, ideological component from the people who um, own, say, obviously, the mass media, the entertainment industry, and all of that, uh, that just um, want really people who don't think about their own reality and about um, others, our empathy, what happened, I don't know, in, in, in Russia, in the Philippines, uh, in Vietnam, all of that. I'm going to talk to you about the possibility of military dictatorship, or maybe in a different form, a dictatorship in Latin America again. Throughout, and I just traveled this year to Panama, Ecuador, Mexico, Bolivia, Peru, Paraguay, Argentina, and Uruguay. And all those, many of those countries have memory museums, like ESMA in Buenos Aires, and I went to the one in Paraguay as well, uh, who had the longest dictator, I think, Strasna. Uh, so given that the people in Latin America have a memory of what happened, uh, how will that work to prevent the return of a kind of dictatorship like that, whereas in the United States they don't have this memory? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think it's very important to, to do this that we're doing today, um, to, to raise our voices, to talk, to write to the MPs. Um, so populism and fascism is a game back, not just in Latin America, but in all parts of the world. And if you see what's happening now with this new candidate in Argentina, who uh, is a, a madman. I mean, he, he, uh, Trump looks like a pretty decent guy in comparison with him. Uh, he looks like a demon. Yeah, <laughs> literally. With his sister, isn't it? There was cousin. Of this, the the candidate in Argentina yeah. is a young guy. Isn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. He looks a little crazy. I, I He's think. absolutely, yeah. uh, I don't know, um, maniac. Uh, so uh, maybe he needs to have, you know, an audible support. But but he he has a chance. Uh, to become um, Argentina's president. And Argentina is suffering. So all this uh, disaster post-COVID uh, inflation is creating a perfect storm um, in Latin America um, for people and, and for fascists to potentially um, get organized and make a comeback. Uh, and they have the press, uh, they have the media, um, and they have the resources. So they would need the United States support to well, yeah, they always need it. They always need it. 
but um, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what's um, the policy right now um, of the United States uh, with Latin America. Um, obviously, with Cuba, um, it changed with Obama, and I, I went to Cuba at that time, and it was all this hope, and, uh, and now we're with Trump, we went back to square zero. Um, and, and, and people in Cuba are suffering, are suffering uh, even worse. Uh, right now, they're suffering even worse uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, so there, there is a lot of problems. And and United States, we like it or not, is important, and we need to know what they're doing, because they're dangerous. They don't want any popular movement, particularly left-wing popular movement yeah, yeah, in yeah. Latin America. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite... Uh, so, so whether this kind of fascism could return would be dependent on the memory of the Latin American people and the ignorance of the North American people. And uh, <coughs> there would be resistance in Latin America, wouldn't there? Yes, yeah, there, there is. Yeah, but not right from now. the North American population no, no, to the no, U.S. No. support. I think that will take generations. Uh, I, I met um, a few um, Americans, um, you know, um, social leaders, um, really, really incredible people. That um, I, I remember this woman um, that she used to make the uh, documentaries. Um, she's American in, in Cuba, in Chile, um, and she used to uh, really, really, really prepare uh, people. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure there will be people in America that they are, they are organized, but they are a minority. Um, so, but we need a lot of more people interested in all of this, so we can uh, basically uh, be an effective uh, resistance uh, about what happened and, and about the potential return of fascism. There's also growing censorship online uh, that yeah. didn't exist 50 years ago. Uh, yeah. Social media being suppressed. If an opinion that goes against U.S narrative, official narrative that comes up. Uh, there was a, there's a woman, Adriana Rios, her name is? Yeah, yeah. Tell me about her. Adriana, the, the, so the, uh, are we talking about the woman who's been... Um, you said walking the streets of Sydney. Yeah, yeah. So I think she's detained at the moment. <coughs> Sorry. She um, she was the secretary of uh, Manuel Contreras, um, one of the worst um, human beings that you could find. He's a, a monster. Um, he, he was known for his uh, cruelty uh, during torture, and, and he did the most uh, horrific crime that you could imagine. But this woman was not only her um, a secretary, and she also partake uh, in torture, and, 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 and we know that, okay? So she, uh, and she's been uh, prosecuted in Chile, uh, and, and she was sentenced in Chile. So um, she escaped. She escaped from, from justice. Uh, so basically what we have here um, is, is someone um, that, is, that is guilty of, of crimes against humanity uh, walking in this same street. And you know, she's taking uh, all, all the step um, that the disappears and, and the torture people in Chile, they didn't have an opportunity you know, to, do, uh, to go to the judiciary system. Uh, and she has exhausted all, all of that, okay? Um, none of the people that she tortured, they had that opportunity. So uh, she's, she has given that. I think it's outrageous. And I, um, I, I have a stress uh, in this trip that people, uh, you know, keep talking to the peace, to the local authority, until we get rid of her and we deport her here to go back to Chile to, 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 to face justice. Does, does Chile and Australia have an extradition treaty, do you know? I am no, I'm not aware of that, yeah. um, but um, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that she will be there. And you say she's detained right now? Yeah, I was told that she was detained. I don't know that 100%, yeah. but I was told by people who are really, um, that really know about that case, lawyers, etc., that she's actually detained. In would, would you like to meet someone like this? Like face her. to face. No, no. To talk to no, tell her. No, I don't have nothing to talk to her because I don't want to talk to a soulless called criminal. For example, what about the grandchildren of Pinochet? Oh well, yeah, have I, I have a really, uh, I have a really, really good story. So <laughs> um, when, when um, the 40th anniversary of the coup d'état, so I'm not talking about 10 years ago, I what went to Chile. Yeah, and then they invited me to a TV show. I said, yeah. 
And then when I was there, uh, she said, well, um, you're going to talk, uh, it's you and him, uh, one of his uh, grandson. And I said, okay, bring her on. Um, I have, I, you know, uh, there was a national TV. And then all of a sudden, uh, I was sitting there. They, they were like two other people, for one from the left and one from the right, like to get an equilibrium. And all of a sudden, uh, the woman, you know, the presenter said, uh, he didn't call, he didn't show up, and uh, uh, because he's a coward. So um, <laughs> he never showed up. So we had an interesting program without him. And <laughs> I said, no, because I didn't have any... Um, I mean, I don't have nothing in him. Right. I think he probably is a victim of his uh, own family. Um, I have no grudge with him, and I wish him well, but I didn't really want to talk to a family, to be honest. But you were ready to? If you, if yeah, 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 I was going to talk to him. Yeah. What do you think about Margaret Thatcher? Margaret Thatcher, I, 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 she, she's, um, um, she was very awful, uh, especially to, to the Chileans. <laughs> Um, I I have um, really I, I I don't even put too much thought uh, to her because she's dead and her reign was like really um, she's pretty much the opposite to all of my principles basically. Which as because as you know obviously she protected Pinochet from being extradited. Yes, yes, she did. And she then did. when he finally left on humanitarian grounds, Britain and he arrived in Chile. She, yeah, she did. And then he gets. Yeah, she had the plane in a wheelchair, and which walk. was the reason why he, he and gets he, up and walks. Yeah, yeah, it's a miracle. Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> he just rise from the dead, you know. Uh, Margaret, Thatcher, uh, Margaret Thatcher has a soft uh, spot, you know, soft um, uh, for, for detectives, and uh, she loves her. You know, uh, Balthazar uh, Garzon, saw, yeah, no, what him. prosecuted him, and he's now a lawyer supporting Julian Assange, or defending Julian Assange. So we have the British government not extraditing Pinochet, one of the most brutal of all the dictators of the post-war period, and now, but they're trying to extradite Julian Assange. Yes, exactly. Well, well that's right. Her. Claire Montgomery, she defended Pinochet and, and the, uh, prosecuted the son. Uh, Baltasar Gasol was in Chile. Uh, it's in Chile right now. Uh, pay, respect, pay respect to Salvador and their followers. Mm -hmm. What does that say about the British government, that they... Let him go. Well, There's a different people in charge, but they let him go, and then they want Julian Assange. Well, the British government, I mean, the British in general, I'm, I'm talking about the government and, and the, um, um, the, play, the what they play during, uh, in history, you know, they the, 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 the are the worst of the, uh, the worst. Of the, they're worse than the Americans, really, if you go back in history. <laughs> uh, and the Americans are like sort of um, offsprings of them. Um, but I think the the, the British, uh, the, the, uh, if you see the history, they have no many, but uh, no one, but many. Um, they, they, they did. They committed, um, you know, genocide quite a few times, including India and, and all the mm -hmm. colonies they had. So they lost their empire, but they've joined the American one. And yeah, yeah. Well, they, they're nostalgic. They crave power, uh, and, and power um, is. It's um, really, um, you know, power is really, uh, it's a drug, uh, especially if you have a hollow heart. And uh, I, I, I think they crave that, they crave that the, 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 old, the old times, they, they miss that, the British. But they, have, they are no empire anymore. One of the uh, results of the coup in Chile was this economic system that was being tried out by the Chicago school. The, the Chicago school. boys, Chicago yeah, neoliberal, neoliberalism. They which yeah. we now call yeah. neoliberals, which is total, uh, it's old uh, laissez-faire, take the government out of politics, out of the economy rather, and let the free market reign completely. Yeah. Uh, this is a very horrible thing that it Chilean is, coup has given to the world. It is awful, awful. Um, so she, she, we, people talk about Pinochet like he, um, I don't know, invented the economy in Chile. Uh, it's all a lie. Uh, Actually, in the in the eighties, uh, when they sold all the um, state companies, the people were really. Uh, it was one of the worst um, economic times in Chile uh, during, during Pinochet, and and they basically stole uh, from you know a, a group, including Piñera, uh, who is a um, vampire. You know, that they they took money from Land Chile, uh, National Airlines, from from all the state companies. Um, they, they treat that as their own business venture. Yeah. Shame of them. Yeah. 
And we haven't come to the end of that. No, 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 it's ongoing, it's ongoing. Mm -hmm. And yes, and Chile was proud to be a pioneer in all of this. And then um, I remember when we were one of the first ones who can take money out of uh, and the people, uh, they thought that, that was like being in such a drama. <laughs> this is still the, the battle that we're, we're facing here, where people resist that, try to return state control of some industries, some equality, and the United States will try to get rid of that kind of government like they did your grandfather. Exactly, right? yeah. They really haven't ended that phase, have they? They haven't, they haven't. They're quite virulent. How do you say virulent? But, yeah. Virulent, yes. Yeah, yeah. Virulent, yeah. yeah. Well, your, fa your grandfather was, uh, uh, what we heard today from the Cuban ambassador was an extraordinary uh, recitation of what Fidel Castro said about your grandfather. He was an inspiration for uh, so many people, and he still is, and I thank you so much. Thank you. For joining thank us today. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank okay. you.